Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My name is Dr. Ayaz Afsa, and our topic today is quantitative data analysis. Quantitative quantitative data analysis has no greater or lesser importance than qualitative analysis. Its use is entirely dependent on fitness for purpose. It is a powerful research form emanating in part from the positivist tradition. It is often associated with large scale research but can also serve smaller scale investigations with case studies, action research, correlational research and experiments. In the following uh, In the following uh, lecture, I will show how numerical data can be reported and introduce some of the most widely used statistics that can be employed in their analysis. Numerical analysis can be performed using software. For example, the statistical package for social sciences abbreviated as SPSS or uh, another Minitab or uh, Excel in the world. Software packages apply statistical formulae and carry out computations. With this in mind, I will avoid extended outlines of statistical formulae, though I do provide details where considered useful. My aim is to explain the concepts that underpin statistical analyses and to do this in as user-friendly a way as possible. I will begin by identifying some key concepts in numerical analyses such as scales of data, parametric and non-parametric data, descriptive and inferential statistics, dependent and independent variables. Throughout this lecture, I will indicate how to report analysis. Begin with scales of data. Before one can advance very far in the field of data analysis, one needs to distinguish the kinds of numbers with which one is dealing. This takes us to the company. This takes us to the commonly reported issue of scales or levels of data. And four are identified, each of which in the order given below, subsumes its predecessor. Number one, the nominal scale, simply denotes categories. One means such and such a category, two means another, and so on. For example, one might denote males, two might denote females. The categories are mutually exclusive and have no numerical meaning. For example, consider numbers on a football shirt. We cannot say that the player wearing number four shirt is twice as anything as a player wearing a number two shirt, nor half as anything as a player wearing a number eight. The number four simply identifies a category, and indeed, nominal data are frequently termed categorical data. The data classify, but have no order. Nominal data include items such as sex, age group, for example, from 30 to 35, 36 to 40, subject taught, type of school, socioeconomic status, etc. Nominal data denote discrete variables entirely separate categories, for example, 
uh, according females the number one category and males the number two category there cannot be an intermediary such as 1.25 or uh, a 1.99 position. The second one is the ordinal scale not only classifies but also introduces an order into the data. These might be rating scales where for example strongly agree is stronger than agree or a very great deal is stronger than very little. It's possible to place items in an order weakest to strongest, smallest to biggest, lowest to highest, least to most and so on. But there is still an absence of a metric means a measure using calibrated uh, equal intervals. Therefore one cannot assume that the distance between uh, each point of the scale is equal. That is the distance between very little and a little may not be the same as the distance between a lot and a very great deal on a rating scale. One could not say for example that in a five point rating scale one strongly disagree, two disagree, three neither agree nor disagree and four agree, five strongly agree. Point four is nobody can say that point four is in twice as much agreement as point two or that point one is in five times more disagreement than point five. However, one could place them in an order. Not at all, very little, a little, quite a lot, a very great deal, I strongly agree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree, strongly agree. That is, it is possible to rank the data according to rules of lesser than, of uh, greater than in relation to whatever the value is included in the rating scale. Ordinal data include items such as rating scales and Likert scales and are frequently used in asking for opinions and attitudes. The interval scale is the next, the third one. The internal scale introduces a metric, a regular and equal interval between each data point as well as keeping the features of the previous two scales, classification and order. This lets us know precisely how far apart are the individuals, the objects or the events that form the focus of our inquiry. Uh, there is an exact and same interval between each data point. Interval level data are sometimes called equal interval scales. The ratio scale is the fourth level that embraces the main features of the previous three scales, classification, order and an equal interval metric but adds a fourth that is a powerful feature a true zero. This enables the researcher to determine proportions easily, twice as many as, half as many as, three times the amount of and so on. Because there is an absolute zero, all of the arithmetical processes of addition, subtraction, multiplication and divisions are possible. Measures of distance, money in the bank, population, time spent on homework, years teaching, income, Celsius temperature, marks on a test and so on are all ratio measures as they are capable of having a true zero quantity. The delineation of these four scales of data is important as the consideration of which statistical test to use is dependent on the scale of data, it is incorrect to apply 
statistics which can only be used at a higher scale of data to data a lower, at a lower scale. For example, one should not apply average or means to nominal data, nor use t-tests and analysis of variances to ordinal data. Which statistical tests can be used with each data are set out uh, clearly later. Now move on to uh, about the parametric and non-parametric data. Non-parametric data are those which make no assumptions about the population, usually because the characteristics of the population are unknown. Parametric data assume knowledge of the characteristics of the population. In order for inferences to be able to be made securely, they often assume a normal Gaussian curve or dis distribution, as in reading scores. In practice, this distinction means this nominal and ordinal data are considered to be non-parametric, while interval and ratio data are considered to be parametric data. The distinction as for the four scales of data is important as the consideration of which statistical test to use is dependent on the kinds of data. It is incorrect to apply parametric statistics to non-parametric data. It is possible to apply non-parametric statistics to parametric data. Non-parametric data are often derived from questionnaires and surveys, while parametric data tend to be derived from experiments and tests, for example, examination scores. Now comes towards uh, uh, statistics, or descriptive or inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics do exactly what they say. They describe and present data. For example, in terms of summary frequencies, uh, this will include, for example, the mode, the score obtain, obtained by the greatest number of people. The mode, the score, which means the score obtained by the greatest number of people, the mean, the average score, the median, the score obtained by the middle person in a rank group of people that it has an equal number of scores above it and below it. Minimum and maximum scores, the range, the distance between the highest and the lowest scores, the variance, a measure of how far scores are from the mean, calculated as the average of the square deviations of individual scores from the mean. The standard deviation, SD, a measure of the dispersal or range of scores calculated as the square root of the variance. The standard error, SE, uh, that is the standard deviation of sample means. The skewness, how far the data are asymmetrical in relation to a normal curve of distribution. Cartridges, how steep or flat is the shape of a graph or distribution of data? A measure of how peaked a distribution is and how steep is the slope or spread of data around the peak. Such statistics make no differences. Sorry. Such statistics make no inferences or predictions. They simply report what has been found in a variety of ways. Inferential statistics, however, by contrast to descriptive uh, uh, statistics, strives to make inferences and predictions based on the data gathered. These will include, for example, hypothesis testing, 
correlations, regression, and multiple regression, difference testing, for example, t-tests, and analysis of variance, factor analysis, and structural equation modeling. Sometimes, simple frequencies and descriptive statistics may speak for themselves. And the careful portrayal of descriptive data may be important. However, often it is the inferential statistics that are more valuable for researchers and typically these are more powerful. One-tailed and two-tailed tests. In using statistics, researchers are sometimes confronted with the decision whether to use a one-tailed or a two-tailed test, which to use is a function of the kind of result one might predict. In a one-tailed test, one predicts, for example, that one group will score more higher than the other, whereas in a two-tailed test, one makes no such prediction. The one-tailed test is a stronger test than the two-tailed test as it makes assumptions about the population and the direction of the outcome. That is, that one group will score more higher than the other and hence, if spotted, is more powerful than a two-tailed test. Researchers often concern relationships between variables. A variable can be considered as a construct, operationalized construct, a particular property in which the researcher is interested. There are two types of variables independent variable and dependent variable. An independent variable is an input variable, that which causes in part or in total a particular outcome. It is a stimulus that influences a response, an antecedent or a factor which may be modified. For example, under experimental or other conditions to affect an outcome. A dependent variable, on the other hand, is the outcome variable, that which is caused in total or in part by the input, and antecedent variable. It is the effect, consequence of, or response to an independent variable. This is a fundamental concept in many statistics. For example, we may wish to see if doing more homework increases student performance. Say in mathematics, we increase the homework and measure the result and we notice, for example, that the performance increases on the mathem mathematics test. The independent vari variable has produced a measured outcome or has it Maybe the threat of the math mathematics test increased the students' concentration, motivation, and diligence in class. The students like mathematics and the mathematics teacher, and this caused them to work harder, not the mathematics test itself. Uh, the students had a good night's sleep before the mathematics test, and hence were refreshed and alert. Uh, the student's performance in the mathematics test, in fact, influenced how much homework they did. The higher the marks, the more they were motivated to doing mathematics homework. Uh, the increase in homework increased the student's motivation for mathematics, and this in turn may have caused the increase in the mathematics test. Uh, the students were told that if they did not perform well on the test, then they would be punished in proportion to how poorly they scored. Many statistics operate with dependent and independent variables. For example, experiments using t-tests and analysis of variance, regression and multiple regression. 
others do not. For example, correlational statistics, factor analysis. If one uses tests which require independent and dependent variables, great caution has to be exercised in assuming which is or is not the dependent or independent variable and whether causality is as simple as the test assumes. Further, many statistic, uh, statistical tests are based on linear relationships, for example, correlation, regression, multiple regression, factor analysis, when in fact the relationships may not be linear. The researcher has to make a fundamental decision about whether in fact the relationships are linear or non-linear and select the appropriate statistical tests with these considerations in mind. To draw these points together, the researcher will need to consider what scales of data are there. Are the data parametric or non-parametric? Are descriptive or inferential statistics required? Do dependent and independent variables need to be identified? Are the relationships considered to be linear or non-linear? The prepared researcher will need to consider the mode of data analysis that will be employed. This is very important as it has a specific bearing on the form of the instrumentation. For example, a researcher will need to plan the layout and structure of a questionnaire survey very carefully in order to assist data entry for computer reading and analysis. An inappropriate layout may abstract data entry and subsequent analysis by computer. The planning of data analysis will need to consider what needs to be done with the data when they have been collected, how will they be processed and analyzed, how will the results of the analysis be verified, cross-checked and validated. Decisions will need to be taken with regard to the statistical tests that will be used in data analysis as this will affect the layout of research items and the computer packages that are available for processing quantitative and qualitative data, for example, SPSS and NUDIST respectively. We need to know how reliable is our instrument for data collection. Reliability in quantitative analysis takes two more forms, both of which are measures of internal consistency. The split half technique and the alpha coefficient both, both calculate a coefficient of reliability that can lie between 0 and 1. Internal consistency can be found in Cronbach's alpha, frequently referred to some simply as the alpha coefficient of reliability. The Cronbach alpha provides a coefficient of inter-item correlations, that is, the correlation of each item with the sum of all the other items. This is a measure of the internal consistency among the items not for example the people. It is the average correlation among all the items in question and is used for multi-item scales. This is a form of analysis which is responsive to the data being presented and is most closely concerned with seeing what the data themselves suggest. Uh, similar to a detective following a line of evidence. The data are usually descriptive. Here much is made of visual techniques of data presentation. Hence frequencies and percentages and forms of graphical presentation 
are often used. A host of graphical forms of data presentation are available in software packages, including, for example, frequency and percentage tables, bar charts for nominal and ordinal data, histograms for continuous interval and ratio data, line graphs, pie charts, high and low charts, scatter plots, stem and leaf displays, box plots, box and visco plots. With most of these forms of data display, there are various permutations of the ways in which data are displayed within the type of chart or graph chosen. While graphs and charts may look appealing, it is often the case that they tell the reader no more than could be seen in a simple table of figures, which take up less space in a report. Pie charts, bar charts, and histograms are particularly particularly prone to this problem, and the data in them could be placed more succinctly into tables. Clearly, the issue of fitness for audience is important here. Some readers may find charts more accessible and able to be understood than tables of figures, and this is important. Other charts and graphs can add greater value than tables, for example, line graphs, box plots, and scatter plots with regression lines, and I would suggest that these are helpful. Here is not the place to debate the strengths and weaknesses of each type, although there are some guidelines here. Bar charts are useful for presenting categorical and discrete data highest and lowest. Avoid using a third dimension in a graph when it is unnecessary. A third dimension to a graph must provide additional information. Histograms are useful for presenting continuous data. Line graphs are useful for showing trends, particularly in continuous data for one or more variables at a time. Multiple line graphs are useful for showing trends in continuous data on several variables in the same graph. Pie charts and bar charts are useful for showing proportions. Interdependence can be shown through cross tabulations. Box plots are useful for showing the distribution of values for several variables in a single chart, together with their range and medians. Stacked bar charts are useful for showing the frequencies of different groups within a specific variable for two or more variables in the same chart. Scatter plots are useful for showing the relationship between two variables are several sets of two or more variables on the same chart. At a simple level, one can present data in terms of frequencies and percentages. From this simple table, that is table 1, we can tell that 191 people completed the item frequencies and percentages for a course evaluation. The course was too hard, that was the question. Frequency and percentage. Not at all, 24. Very little, 49. That is the frequency here. And this is the percentage. A little, 98. 51.3. Quite a lot, 16, 8.6, a very great deal. So the data is presented in a tabular form showing frequencies and percentages. Most respondents thought, the table shows, that the course was 
a little too hard. With a response number of 98, that is the highest, uh, with the, that is 51.3 percent. The modal score is that category or score which is given by the highest number of respondents. The results were skewed with only 10.5 percent being in the categories quite a lot and a very great deal. More people thought that the course was not at all too hard then thought that the course was quiet a lot or a very great deal too hard. Overall, the course appears to have been slightly too difficult, but not much more. Let's imagine that uh, we wish to explore this piece of data further. We may, we may wish to discover, for example, the voting on this item by males, and females. This can be presented in a simple cross tabulation following the convention of placing the nominal data male or female in rows and the ordinal data the five point scale in the columns. A, a cross tabulation is simply a presentational device whereby one variable is presented in relation to another with the relevant data inserted into each cell. See the following box. So in this box you see the uh, right hand column male, female and then the total in percentage. Uh, that was uh, the, the, the nominal scale and this is the horizontal shows the degree of agreement, not at all, very little, a little, quite a lot, a very gradual and then total. So it means if you count um, out of 50, that is 7 is the number and the total percentage 3.7, number and percentages are, count means the numbers and percentage means the percentage is given. The above table, this table shows that of the total sample, nearly three times more females, that is uh, the females 3.8 a liter, um, three point eight uh, percent, then males three point one percent. 13.1 percent, that is male in percentage, and that is female a little, is the answer. Thought that the course was a little too hard. Between two-thirds and three-quarters more females, that is 19.9 percent, than males, 5.8 percent thought that the course was a very little too hard, and around three times more males, 1.6 percent, then females, 0.5 percent thought that the course was a very great deal too hard. However, one also has to observe that the size of the two subsamples was uneven. Around three quarters of the sample were females. They were 73.8 percent and around one quarter, that is 26.2 percent, was male. There are two ways to overcome the problem of uneven subsample sizes. One is to adjust the sample, in this case by multiplying, multiplying up the subsample of males by an exact figure in order to make the two subsamples the same size. So it would be calculated something like 141 divided by 50 is equivalent to 2. 0.82. Another way is to examine the data by each row rather than by the overall totals. That is to examine the proportion of males voting such and such and separately the proportion of females voting for the same categories of the variable as shown in the following uh, table or a box. 
the male count, the female count, and the total. And these are the same categories, not at all. That is a scale, very little, a little, quite large. In this table, one can observe that there was consistency in the voting for males and females in terms of the categories a little and quite a lot. A little, 50 percent of the male and 73, means 52 percent, 50 percent, 52 percent, a little, quite a lot, 8 percent and 8.5 percent male and female answers. More males, 6 percent than females, 0.7 percent thought that the course was a very great deal too hard. A slightly higher percentage of females, that is 91.1 percent, 12.1 percent plus 27 uh, percent plus 52 percent, then males 86 percent. So 14 percent plus 22 percent plus 50 percent indicated overall that the course was not too hard. The over, overall pattern of voting by males and females was similar. That is for both males and females, the strong to weak categories in terms of voting percentages were identical. I would suggest that this uh, second table is more helpful than the first table as by including the raw percentages it renders f fairer the comparison between the two groups, male, males and females. Further, I would suggest that it is usually preferable to give both the actual frequencies and percentages, but to make the comparisons by percentages, I will say this because it is important for, the, uh, for you to know the actual numbers used. For example, in the first table, if we were simply to be given the percentage of males voting that the course was a very great deal too hard, that was 1.6 percent. As course planners, we might worry about this. However, when we realize that 1.6 percent is actually only 3 out of 141 people, then we might be less worried. Had the 1.6 percent represented, say, 50 people of a sample, then this would have given us cause for concern. Percentages on their own can mask the real numbers, and the reader needs to know the real numbers. It is possible to comment on particular cells of a cross tabulated matrix in order to draw attention to certain factors, for example, the very high 52 percent in comparison to its neighbor 8.5 percent in the voting of females in the table above. It also, it is also useful on occasions to combine data from more than one cell as done in the example above. For example, if we combine the data from the males in the categories quiet a lot and a very great deal, 8% plus 6%, 14%, we can observe that not only is this equal to the category not at all, but also it contains, it contains fewer cases than any of the other single categories for the males. That is, the combined category shows that the voting for the problem of the course being too difficult is still very slight. Combining categories can be useful in showing the general trends or tendencies in the data. For example, in the tables following uh, boxes 1 to 3, combining not at all, very little and a little, all of these measures indicate that it is only a very small problem of the course being too hard. That is, generally speaking, the course was not too hard. Combining categories can also be useful 
in rating scales of agreement to disagreement. For example, consider the following results in relation to a survey of 200 people on a particular item. See the box following. 200 people strongly agree, 30, 15 percent disagree, 40, 20 percent neither agree nor disagree, 70, that is 35 percent of the data, agree 20, 10 percent and strongly agree with the 40 number and that is the 20 percent of the total. There are several ways of interpreting this box. For example, more people strongly agree 20 percent then strongly disagree, that is 15 percent. Other model score was for the central neutral category or central tendency of neither agree nor disagree. However, one can go further. If one wishes to ascertain an overall indication of disagreement and agreement, then adding together the two disagreement categories yields 35 percent, that is 15 percent and 20 percent to put together, and adding together the two, two agreement categories yields 30 percent, 10 percent and 20 percent. There, there was more disagreement than agreement, despite the fact that more respondents strongly agreed than strongly disagreed. That is, the strength of agreement and disagreement has been lost. By adding together the two disagreement and agreement categories, it gives us a general rather than a detailed picture. This may be useful for our purposes. However, if we uh, do this, then we also have to draw attention uh, to the fact that the total of the two disagreement categories, that is 35 percent, is the same as the total in the category, neither agree nor disagree. In which case, one could suggest that the modal category of neither agree nor disagree has been superseded by bimodality, bi with disagreement being one modal score and neither agree nor disagree being the other. Combining categories can be useful although it is not without its problems. For example, let's consider three tables from 5 to 7 following. The first presents the overall results of an imaginary course evaluation in which three levels of satisfaction have been registered, low, medium, and high, as shown in box number 5, this one. The male female and their satisfaction with the course from low, medium and high and the total number. Satisfaction with the course uh, that is uh, 60, 41 percent male and 35 is the number 43 percent and medium 70 and 85 number and high is 15 and 45 in number. Here we can see that the modal category is low, 95 votes, 42 percent, and the lowest category is high, 41 votes, 20 percent. That is, uh, overall the respondents are dissatisfied with the course. The females seem to be more satisfied with the course than the males. If the category high is used as an indicator and the males seem to be more moderately satisfied with the course than the females. However, if one combines categories low and medium, then a different story would be told in the following box, number six. That is this one. Satisfaction level. By looking at the percentages, here it appears that the females are more satisfied with the course overall than males and that the males are more dissatisfied with the course than females. However, 
if one were to combine categories differently, medium and high, then a different story could be told in this one. By looking at the percentages here, it appears that the females are more satisfied with the course overall than males and that the males are more dissatisfied with the course than females. However, if one were to combine categories differently, then this appears. By looking at the percentages here, it appears that there is not much difference between the males and the females and that both males and females are highly satisfied with the course. At issue here is the notion of combining categories or collapsing tables. And I will suggest great caution in doing this. Sometimes it can provide greater clarity and sometimes it can distort the picture. In the example, it is wiser to keep with the original table rather than collapsing it into fewer categories. In examining data, we can look to see how evenly or widely the data are distributed. For example, a line graph shows how respondents voted and how well learners are guided and supported in their learning, awarding marks out of 10 for the voting with a sample size of 400 respondents as shown in box 8. 400 respondents, that is the number count, and this is the level. How well learners are cared for, guided, and supported. One can see here the data are skewed. It has a tail to the left and it is gathered to the right, accumulated to the, to the right. So this is a kind of skewness. The data skewed with more vote being received at the top end of the scale. There is a long tail going to the negative end of the score. So even though the higher scores are given at the top end of the scale, we say that this table has a negative skew because there is a long tail down. By contrast, let's look at a graph of how much staff taken voluntarily rolled in the score with 150 votes received and awarding marks out of 10 as shown in box number uh, 9. Here one can observe a long tail going toward the upper end, means to the right. And one can observe it's going to the top end or it is to the right and most of the data is towards the left. Another example of skewness. And the bulk of the scores, yeah, you can see in that a long tail going toward the upper end of the scores and the bulk of the scores being in the lower range, even though most of the scores are in the lower range. Because the long tail is towards the upper end of the scale, this is termed a positive skew. The skewness of the data is an important feature to observe in data and to which to draw attention. If we have interval and ratio data, then in addition to the modal scores and cross tabulations, we can calculate the mean, means average, and the standard deviation. Let's imagine that we have the test scores for 1,000 students on a test that was marked out of 10, as shown in box test scores, that is a frequency and valid percentage. Here we can calculate that the average score was 
We can also calculate the standard deviation, which is a standardized measure of the dispersal of the scores. That is how far away from the mean or average each score is. It is calculated in its most simplified form uh, as uh, the diagram is not good here. Standard deviation is d square, it is under root d square divided by n1, where d2, the deviation of the score from the mean average squared, and the and the square square the sum of and n is the number of cases. A low, a low standard deviation indicates that the scores cluster together, while a high standard deviation indicates that the scores are widely dispersed. This is calculated automatically by software packages such as SPSS at the simple click of a single button. In the example here, the standard deviation in the example of scores was 2.134. What does this tell us? First, it suggests that the marks were not very high, an average of 5.48 out of 10. Second, it tells us that there was quite, quite a variation in the scores. Third, one can see that the scores were unevenly spread. Indeed, there was a high cluster of scores around the categories of 3 and 4, and another high cluster of scores around the categories of 7 and 8. 32, 39. This is where a line graph could be useful in representing the scores as it shows two peaks clearly as in the following box, the peak one between the three and four highest and then you have the second peak where they are between seven and eight test scores. It is important to report the standard deviation. For example, let's consider the following. Look at these three sets of numbers. If you have one, two, three, four and then twenty their mean would be 6. And we have 1, 2, 6, 10, and 11, again the mean is 6. And 5, 6, 6, 6, and 7, you add them all together, divide by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and again the mean is 6. If we were to plot these points onto three separate graphs, we would see very different results. Look at these boxes. Distribution around a mean with an outlier. So you have one, two, three, and four instances here, and one is 20. It is called outlier because because of this, all the scores will be influenced. And look at uh, box number 12. Shows the mean being heavily affected by the single score of 20 and outlier. An extreme score a long way from the others. In fact, all the other four scores are some distance below the mean. Where is the mean? Mean is six. And all other instances, one, two, three, and four instances are below the mean, far below the mean. And there is only one instance that is far above the mean. And because of this, how the mean is affected. The score of 20 is exerting a disproportionate effect on the data and on the mean, raising it. Some stati statistical packages like SS SPSS can take out outliers. If the data are widely spread, then it may be more suitable not to use the mean, but to use the median score. SPSS performs this automatically at a click of a button. The median is the midpoint score of a range of data. Half of the scores fall above it and half below it. 
if there is an even number of observations, then the median is the average of the two middle scores. Box 13 shows one score actually on the mean, but the remainder some distance away from it. The scores are widely dispersed and the shape of the graph is flat, a platycultic distribution. There, this is the mean, and on both sides they are far from the mean, from the center. The, f the following box shows the scores clustering very tightly around the mean with a very peak shape to the graph that is called a leptocurtic distribution. That this is the mean and all data is clustered around this. It is the opposite of uh, box number four where the data is far from the mean to the left or to the right. Significance of distribution of different scores. The point at stake is this. It is not enough simply to calculate and report the mean. For a fuller picture of the data, we need to look at the box 12 dispersal of scores. For this, we require the statistic of the standard deviation, as this will indicate the range and degree of dispersal of the data. Though the standard deviation is susceptible to the disproportionate effects of outliers, some scores will widely disperse uh, the first graph, others will be evenly disperse the second graph, and others will be bunched together the third graph. A high standard deviation will indicate a wide dispersal of scores, a low st standard deviation will indicate clustering or bunching together of scores. As a general rule, the mean is a useful statistic if the data are not skewed or if there are no outliers that may be exerting a disproportionate effect. One has to recall that the mean as a statistical calculation only can sometimes yield some strange results, for example, fractions of a person. The median is useful for ordinal data, but to be meaningful, there have to be many scores rather than just a few. The median overcomes the problem of outliers and hence is useful for skewed results. The model score is useful for all scales of data, particularly nominal and ordinal data that is discrete rather than continuous data and it is unaffected by outliers. Though it is not strong, if there are many values and many scores which occur with similar frequency. Well, uh, what can we do with simple frequencies in exploratory data analysis? The answer to this question depends on the scales of data that we have, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. For all four scales, we can calculate frequencies and percentages and we can consider presenting these in a variety of forms. We can also calculate the mode and present cross tribulations. We can consider combining categories and collapsing tables into smaller tables, providing that the sensitivity of the original data has not been lost. We can calculate the median score which is particularly useful if the data are spread widely or if there are outliers. For interval and ratio data, we can also calculate the mean and the standard deviation. The mean yields an average and the standard deviation indicates the range of dispersal of scores around that average. That is to see 
whether the data are widely dispersed, for example in a platycurtic distribution, are close together with a distinct peak in a lap leptocurtic distribution. In examining frequencies and percentages, one also has to investigate whether the data are skewed, that is overrepresented at one end of a scale and underrepresented at the other end. A positive skew has a long tail at the positive end and the majority of the data at the negative end. And a negative skew has a long tail at the negative end and the majority of the data at the positive end. Well, that was all about quantitative analysis. We have already accomplished qualitative data analysis. And uh, some of these ideas we have already discussed with reference to some of the data collection methods like questionnaires and their analysis, observations, case studies, etc. That is uh, all about uh, uh, quantitative data analysis and uh, that is the end of the lecture. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye.